Welcome back to our channels, Warriors. We are still growing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and smash it right now. Today, we have a special guest, a special interview, all right? The homie Will. I met this guy, right? I left, I left my career. People started reaching out, networking. This is one of the beautiful things about doing this, right? Helping others. So that's how I met him, right? I met him through the gym, a local gym, well-known, actually called The Gym. Homies yoked. The homies yoked. So I was like, all right. I went on his podcast called The Post P Chronicles. I did an interview there, right? So now we're just repaying the favor, getting the message out there, expanding, right? And putting that information out for you guys. What's up, Will? How you doing, dude? Man, I'm doing great, man. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you for having me on. You are doing incredible things. I see you. I watch you. Man, keep doing what you're doing, definitely. And again, appreciate it. Appreciate it, dude. Uh, go ahead and give us, uh, uh, where'd you grow up at, man? Uh, man, you know, I grew up in Southeast San Diego. Um, those of you, I know San Diego has a lot of palm trees. It's a lot of beautiful, but you, <laughs> that is probably the roughest. I wouldn't even say that probably. It is the roughest part of San Diego, especially when I was growing up, um, which is, you know, the late, late 90s, early 2000s. And, you know, that, yeah, that's where I grew up at, San South, Diego. Southeast San Diego, man. It's, you know, I never really hung out there, but it's something you do hear about, right? Is that, is that where uh, the Fam Mart is? Fam Bam? Yeah, that's Fam Bam, man. I, <laughs> yeah, you got to know I, about Fam I I've been there, man. I've been there. <laughs> uh, I had a couple of homies that lived in the area right there, so I would visit them from time to time. Yeah. Um, so did you grow up? in any in any gangs i mean you said you grew up in that neighborhood yeah so the area i grew up in is called skyline hills and the gang that runs that area is called skyline so skyline powerus um those of you who are not familiar with that what Paru is it's you understand what a blood is so it's basically essentially that um so i say around 14 years old that's when i became official that's when i became officially a skyline gang member and everything I did contributed to the game. You say become official. Is there an initiation process of getting jumped in, anything like that? So I grew up in Skyline, and so I did not get jumped in. So my me being official was the work that I started to put in. So I was um, unofficial up until that point, just claiming it and, you know, all those different things. And um, But I never got jumped in um i never got jumped into the gang i was accepted everybody just accepted me as from skyline up until that point because i grew up and i would get in fights with you know people from the gang all those different things but that's when my 14 years old that's when that's when i really jumped off course like yeah this is what it is you know so were there or um ogs in the hood people that had been around the block people that had been in prison and back in the day were there dudes that you looked up to um there were a lot of a lot of dudes that I looked up to. My my uncles are OGs from Skyline. Um, so they were two two individuals I looked up to, but just in the immediate neighborhood, see I used to hang out in my in my part of Skyline, I used to hang out at the Boys and Girls Club. And <laughs> which is um ironic because the Boys and Girls Club is where the recruitment started, you know and all the older kids they weren't ogs but let's say i was 12 13 they were 17 18 some 20 and they would hang out at the park and so those are the dudes i looked up to you know and every time i came around they would give me candy or they would give me a little bit of money or things like that and i would hang out with them then i started smoking with them and you know it just progressed from there but those are the individuals that i looked up to for sure in Southeast San Diego, was there certain areas more dangerous than others? Because I've heard of like a certain intersection or one where it's like, hey, there's like shootings right there all the time or at that time. Four corners. You talking about the four corners of death. Is that there? Yes. Um, yeah, this four corners of death is in the Southeast. It's not what it used to be. I, I'm not even going to, what I'm not going to do is lie to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it got that name for a reason that it, it was it, that name was earned and that's not something i'm bragging about because it you know it's not something i like to perpetuate but yeah the southeast in the early 90s um yeah was one of the murder capitals of the united states 
you know, in the early 90s and in the years that I grew up in, the late 90s, early 2000s, it was it was hectic. It was really hectic. Um, people were dying a lot. People was getting shot a lot. Most of my friends are either doing life in prison, you know, right now or or dead. And it, it was a lot. It was a lot going on. And as a result of that specific time frame and that specific area, your, your homies are locked up or dead because of that? Definitely. Man. Directly connected to, you know, growing up in the Southeast. If it's not my homies, then you have, you know, people from the on the opposite side from Lincoln or, you know, the coast. It was a lot of people. It was a lot of things happening. And a lot of people went to jail for life. A lot of people died. But it was majority, a lot of people going to jail for life. Life. A lot of, a lot of people. So we painted the picture of what is like right there in South East San Diego. What was the goal, man? What was the mission as far as like, hey, you're gang banging? What is what is what are you guys trying to obtain? Um, power, money, a dope, uh, respect. What what was it? The end game? Um, as a as a child, I can say our end goal was to be recognized. Hmm. There was no let's get money, let's get rich. That that was never the goal because we didn't do anything to achieve those goals. You know, we probably did a little bit of rob and did you know things like that in order to supplement the things that we wanted, like drink, weed, some clothes, a little bit of jewelry, but never let's get money, let's stack, let's get houses, let's get car, let's do all that. You know, it was just to supplement the little things that we were doing. But our main goal was to get our names out there. That was the goal. You know, as an adult, I can tell you in looking back, like, man, it was there was no goal. Like we wasn't doing anything. It's sad, really. It's truly sad. No, I hear you. I hear you. That's why we're doing what we're doing, man. I hear you yeah. for for sure. Now, can you walk me through if you're comfortable talking about when you got <laughs> incarcerated, um, prison time to, for your right. sentencing? Uh, right. What what that was like. Um, and you can elaborate as much as you want from the time of your arrest, from your time you're hanging out in county, the, the, the sentencing, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll touch into the prison. Definitely. So um, let me see. So I was arrested um, February, February 7th, 2006. I was 17 years old um, for a murder and attempted murder. So, man, immediately when I was arrested, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I'm sitting in there. And I'm in, I'm actually in juvenile hall and I'm not taking it serious. I'm not taking it serious because of my warped belief system. I'm just like, oh, this is just another thing. I'm going to court with my homies and we laughing. We, you know what I'm saying? We joking, all those different things until I went to my arraignment and the judge said, yeah, you're looking at 75 years to life. And that's when reality set in. I'm like, oh, shit. It's real, <laughs> you know, it, it's real. Um, and honestly, I went back to my cell, which was, I was 17 years old, I was young, I was a kid. I know now I was a child and I cried. I cried for the reality of, man, I may never get up out of here again. Um, and so everything after that, once I dried my tears, it was back to, all right, man, you from Skyline, you know, do what you gotta do. So it was a lot of fighting, it was a lot of just, in my juvenile hall days, just a lot of fighting, um, just chilling with my homies. And at never at no point did I want to better myself because I was still stuck in that mentality. Um, from there, when I turned 18, so I fought my case from 17 all the way into 18. Uh, on my 18th birthday, they took me to the county jail. You know, they took me to the county jail with all these grown men. And I'm in my, if you if you know, I had a um, juvenile hall clothes on, so a unit confinement. So they look at me and they're like, this is a kid. <laughs> I look like a kid to all these grown men. Uh, my county jail time was a little, was a little better because I was a young homie. And so everybody I was around was my older homies. So they, they embraced me. And the case that I was in there for, you know, they look at that as a badge of honor you know like when you take the life of someone else now mind you let me let me add this i did not personally shoot anyone i didn't shoot anyone so what i got locked up for was being there and at that time if you were there you were just as culpable and because i had again that that belief system i didn't tell so i wrote it out and by me writing it out i got 21 years in prison and this was in 2006. Yes. 
2006. I was convicted in 2007. Man, you're touching a lot of real stuff there, man, because you're and you were 17 years old, which yes. is which is a child, man. Let's keep it real. That is young. That's a child. Um, True. In 2006, man, the crazy thing is, is I didn't grow up in a gang, right? But my mom would always tell me, Hector, you're hanging out with that bra uh, bad crowd. If they get arrested, you're going to get arrested. If you get caught, if you're with them and something goes down, you're going to go to jail. And I would always be like, nah, nah. <laughs> it did end up happening to me, at, you know, at right. one point. But right. so I could see how that, how, how you got, how you got caught up in that, man. I could see how you got caught up in that. Did you feel, hey, since I'm not technically the guilty person person at hand behind you know the, the gun did you feel that you had that that you did you feel that you were not going to get that type of penalty honestly from day one i felt like i was gonna i was gonna get life in prison i felt like i was gonna get life in prison because that's how the laws were written that's how they were given it to me so and then we had individuals who were um cooperating they were cooperating with the DA. So I really felt like it was an uphill battle for me. So I was just basically wrapping my mind around spending my life in prison. Now, were any of your homies cooperating? Yes. At that time, how did you, how did you feel about that? Um, I felt like, I felt like they were cowards, you know, and this is my mind state back then. So we speaking of the person I was at that point, and I felt like they were cowards. And the reason why is because I've always had this belief that um, if you sign up for something or if you do something, if you have the mind state, this is what I'm going into it to do, then you ride what goes along with that. You know, so I'm not going to go to a store with you and say, hey, we're going to rob this store. And then now that I get caught, like, well, well, Hector was there too. You know, I knew what I was getting myself into, you know, and for the most part, and I still, I still hold a lot of those beliefs, but not as a gang member, just as a man taking responsibility for my actions, you know? And so by me telling on you, it doesn't absolve me from responsibility. I did, I committed a crime. So let me take responsibility for my actions without bringing everybody down with me. Now, moving forward in my life, I'm not moving like that. So if, if me and you go, to the yeah. bed, you know, and I'm thinking we just going in here and get some some yeah. some uh, mamas or something, and you like, you know what, go rob this place. I'm like, no, Hector, you did that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, oh, that was, right. You know? I hear you, man. But hey, dude, I'm glad you said that was a, that was a gem. That was a gem for the people listening, man. And it's 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 a code. It's a code. It's honor. I hear when you say, "Hey, man, I don't participate in those activities anymore, but I still hold myself accountable." Right? Yeah. And it's the same way with us, man. You ain't gonna go be telling when you knew what everybody was gonna be doing, right? And, right. and we see a lot of that on our side too, man. Just so you know, the green side. Oh, definitely. Um. Okay. California's uh, Department of Corrections, man. Where where'd you go to reception at right off the bat? So I started my reception in Donovan. Okay. When Donovan was, so you know this is a while ago when Donovan was a reception center. Right. And it it again, it was just another it was cool for me because I was the young homie. So I'm 18 years old in Donovan and all my older homies. So they everybody taking me up under their wing, like we got you. And again, because of the crime I was in there on, it was like a badge of honor. Now I again I don't find it honorable now. You know, I find it horrible, you feel me? But at the moment at that time, yeah, I'm like, okay, I got this. Reception, you get endorsed to a prison. What's the a uh, uh, uh the, the first prison that you hit besides Donovan. <laughs> now, now, now I'm going to go back because when I was in juvenile hall, they used to have these uh, videos called locked up. Uh, I don't know if you, if you're familiar, they had used to have locked up. So they would show us the videos of locked up. And one in particular was Pelican Bay. And I saw the riot in Pelican Bay. And I said, that is the only prison I don't want to go to fast forward endorsed Riggs. You're going to Donovan. I'm like, I mean, you're going to Pelican Bay. I said, no, the hell I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got to check your paper again. I'm not going there. <laughs> Man. Man. 
it was something, man. It was definitely something. I go back to my building and I tell my older homie, like, where are you going? I'm like, Doc, and the, the, you can see the color drain from their face, which caused the color to drain from my face. I'm like, damn, bro, you really scared? I'm 18, bro. Don't do me like wow, that. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, time, yeah. time frame wise. I, I just did a video on that uh, Pelican Bay riot, two, 2000, I believe. So here you are. Here you are in Donovan, man, reception 2007. The only place you did not want to go to is Pelican <laughs> Bay. And that's the first place they sent you, man. Oh, they did me like that. <laughs> what, what was it? A uh, le level four, uh, 180? One, yes, sir. 180. You're in there with the big dogs, man. And you're big 18. Dog. Yes. Okay. Were you embraced there? Was the culture different amongst the population? Immediately. I was embraced. I, I, I felt the love immediately because, as you know, there is, um, you know, prison is broken up. So you got the, you know, the Hispanics, the whites, the blacks, but even the blacks are broken up to the Bay Area, the Crips, the Bloods. And I was a blood. And so I was embraced by that car, what we call a car, you right. know. And again, I was young. My very first experience <laughs> is, they try to move me in a cell with an individual and this individual, he was single cell. And so he told the police, he wasn't in there at the time. So I'm moving my stuff in. I'm not knowing, you know, everything. And he comes back from school and he tells the police, if I go in there, I'm gonna kill him. Right. So I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> what? It, I'm like, what's going on here? He's like, yeah, I, I'll kill him. I'll kill him. So fast forward, he goes to the, he goes to the whole, but in my little 18 year old scared heart, I'm thinking like, <laughs> door open up. I'm on you. I'm not about to let you come. This I hear what you're saying, but I'm terrified. I'm terrified. It's a grown man, you know? Um, so that was my introduction. So the, the cell door was closed. You were inside the cell and you overhear this guy saying that? Yes. I overhear him because he's basically, when he comes from school, you know, the 180 design, yeah. every is walled off and doored off so when he comes in he's in our section and it's very small so he's talking to the tower he's telling them oh. like yeah if i sell i'm gonna kill him who's in my cell let like, me you gotta sell it i'll kill him man at the door like <laughs> all right <laughs> you were waiting <laughs> you were waiting <laughs> man so was there any tension, tension amongst the races, amongst the factions, the cars at that time, initially? Um, at that time, no, I came, I came at a good time. Honestly, I came at a really good time. There were no racial riots, and I was up there for four years. Man. There were no racial riots on my yard. And as you know, Pelican Bay doesn't have, even now, I don't believe, they don't have 50-50 yards. They don't have Correct. PC yards. Only two yards. It's only A yard and B yard. You know, and so I'm me being on a yard. There was really nowhere I can go. You know, there was, you know, you mess up. You can't go to C, D, and E. No, it's right. only A and B yard, and they're both filled with people with life in prison, life without. Don't care, whatever happens, happens. You know, so but I so I got lucky. Did you eventually go to another prison after that? Yes, after so I've been to seven prisons. Seven. I was. Them. Yeah, I've been to seven prisons. I ended up doing um, four years in Pelican Bay. I only caught two. I caught two batteries. No, I caught one battery. Yeah, I caught one battery in Pelican Bay. And then what, but what, was, after, that, what was that about? Um, you know what? It was a it wasn't even supposed to be a battery. It was a <laughs> it was a bro, it was literally <laughs> and somebody got in my face and asked him to back up. He got in my face again. So I did what I was supposed to do, right. you know, but there's cameras everywhere. So the reason why they charged me with a battery is because I swung on him first. You know, being a lieutenant and hearing those RVR hearings, man, I always try to keep it fair. I always try to gather, you know, it's so it's challenging, man. It's difficult. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, the simple thing, would, what people normally do is find everybody guilty just right off the bat. Yeah. Right. But I always try to hear like, all right, man, tell me what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's a lot. I would say this though, I've I've come across a lot of um, lieutenants and all my RVRs, because all my 115s were always um, like for violence or yeah. fighting or two-on-ones or things like that. I never got the silly write-ups, you know, right, I never got, right. silly, 
but you being, as you know, when you're a part of something, it's sometimes you, you're going to raise your hand. And I always, I was always one to raise my hand because I never wanted anyone to tell me that I had to do anything. You know, you're not going to tell you over here. No. <laughs> right. No. Right. Yeah. Um, after Pelican Bay, did you, did you hit high desert? I actually did. So I went to Corcoran. I started, I went. Uh, from Pelican Bay, I went to Corcoran. I ended up going to the hole for six months when I got there. From Corcoran, I went to Calipat. Uh, when I was in Calipat, I caught a knife case and did a year in the shoe. Um, and uh, once again, it wasn't my knife. It was my Sally's knife. They whooped me. They found the knife in my Sally's uh, coffee jar on his on his locker. But they found me guilty. I'm like, wow. It's incredible. Yes. All right, we're, we're we're gonna back it up, man. I'm gonna give you a trophy because you hey, you just named all the uh, all the wild rocking and rolling <laughs> prisons, man. Before I even got started, you know what I mean? Uh, for the viewers out there, okay, California, from the north to the south, there's there's some, there was about 34 prisons. Some were more notorious than others, right? For for <laughs> for the reputation of being violent, right? And me yeah. from down south, the the prisons he just named are those prisons. You had Pelican Bay, Corcoran, Calipat, and he said High Desert, right? So, man, go ahead and go ahead and walk me through every prison that you got to and a major event at each one that stands out in your mind. All right. Um, let me see. So we did uh, uh, we did Pelican Bay. There was a riot amongst the Northanios and the Southsiders. There was one of those um, specifically one of the North Northanios, and I'm not gonna lie, the Northanios they 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 performed outstandingly because um, they were like 15 15 deep. They were like 15 deep on the yard, and one of them had some a disrespectful tattoo, and somebody told him, "Man, put your shirt on." Right. But it put your shirt on. When it's outside, it put your shirt on. So from that, he put his shirt on, but they got every single North they on that yard to the yard, signed up for medical, and they rushed the Southsiders, and they performed, else, and I'm talking about like 15 on 40. Man. It was, it was, it was outstanding, you know, from that perspective. It was like, man, um, uh, David and Goliath, that's how it looked, David and Goliath. Were you, uh, from, uh, at that time, you, you were <clears> just, uh, you, you guys had to take a seat, right? You guys were not involved? Yeah, we weren't involved. It was strictly the North Angels and the South Siders. So we were involved. Yeah, so it was that. Then Cal uh, Corcoran. Corcoran wasn't open that long. So we got down there um, in 2011, and they switched it from a, a GP level three because, no, a 270, excuse me. It was a two, I was a 270 at the time. So they, they switched it from a GP 270, and within a year, they moved everybody out and turned it protective custody PC SNY. So it wasn't open that long. And so I ended up going to Calipat. From Calipat, um, I wasn't in Calipat that long, man. I, it's, it's crazy. I wasn't in, I was in Calipat for two months. As you know, I was in Pelican Bay. Calipat is only an hour and a half from San Diego. So I was so excited to be right. that close home. And then they moved me to sail with this guy, this weirdo. <laughs> and he does this. And now I'm doing a one year shoe turn, man. you know on something I never seen, didn't know was there, none of that. But again, I can't say anything because of, you know, my code of ethics and because I'm in prison, I'm not going to say anything, but yeah. And he ended up PCing up actually. Oh he man. And try to tell on me, but I had already heard my RVR and the DA declined. So I just got a year shoe term and he was PC on his knife. <laughs> I was like, this is ridiculous. This, this world is crazy. Um, so from there, I went to Lancaster, um, pending, pending my transfer to, uh, to high desert, nothing really happened in Lancaster. And cause I was only there for like three months. So I was in Calipat for two months, did a year shoe, got kicked out to Lancaster, pending transfer, went to high desert. And that's, yeah, high it was crazy. So at, 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 you were at Calipat, you were, you were, you were an hour and a half away from your hometown, man. Yeah. Did yeah. you did you get the visits you were expecting? The did you get the perks of being close to home that you were expecting? No, I did not. No, I did not. So the four years I was in Cal uh, Pelican Bay, I hadn't received a visit. 
um, when I got to Cork and I was there for a year, I received a visit, but because I was already in the hole, I was in the hole for six months. The first visit I ever got was in the hole. And my dad flew out here from Texas um, to come see me. And it was like a 30 minute visit behind the, behind the glass. Now, I was in the hole, that's on me. I'm not saying they did anything wrong because that's what they were supposed to do. Right. But as, as a human, I hated it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I just hated it. I knew that's it is what it is, but yeah, I, I hated it. Um, then I got to Calipat. I wasn't there long enough to get a visit as far as like fill out the visiting form because I hadn't filled one out when I was in Pelican Bay because nobody was going to come see me. And I didn't want to fill visiting forms out knowing that no one was going to come all the way up there to see me, you know? So yeah. talk, talk to me on an emotional level, how you felt, how you felt being so close to home, but yet not being able to grasp it. Um, at that, like, emotionally, being in San Diego felt, I mean, be, that's how it felt. It felt like San Diego, because when you come through yeah. all the, the Chargers, you just yeah, see, yeah, yeah. and so coming from up north, it's all Raiders, it's all okay. Niners, and I'm like, man, I'm home. Like, that's how it felt. Alex, that was right. far back, it felt like home, you know? Um, so that was amazing, and then being on the yard and seeing all these people from San Diego, you know, in in prison, San Diego is, I don't care if you're Hispanic, I don't care if you're white, I don't care if you're black, if you see somebody from San Diego, it's an immediate, what's up, man? <laughs> yeah. What's up, bro? Go to? Like, it's, yeah. it's immediate love, you know, it's immediate love. And I felt that when I got there. And so I didn't really feel the sting of not getting a visit in that moment because I felt love being home from everybody on the yard right you know so that. yeah man because that, that, that sounds like wow I, I probably like a lot you know what i mean like a lot just being close close to home but then you hit lancaster high desert yeah. back yeah so right you touch down in high desert back up back up to the top of northern california was it winter time yeah. summertime was it freezing winter time it was snowing <laughs> yeah man yeah was that a sh was the weather in itself a shock man the weather was 100 percent shock you know like i said that was the first time i ever seen snow and i'm not talking i seen <laughs> it a little bit once it hit the ground it just melts you know stuff oh so it was packed i'm throwing snowballs it was it was different to say the wow. least um yeah. uh what, what was the yard 180 yeah, 180. Back to a one. Okay. Yeah. Um, politics. Politics. What were the dynamics? Um, honestly, you know, everybody talks about Pelican Bay and things like that. Pelican Bay didn't have anything on High Desert. You know, we you see somebody getting stabbed every, sometimes every day, but majority every week. But when I first got up there, it was lockdown after lockdown after lockdown. Um, so we might go to yard this day, but then now we locked down for two weeks and then we go to yard again one time, then we locked down for two weeks. And then it was just, you know, so on and so forth, um, because they stopped those, those year long lockdowns, right, they, right. they put into that. So you could only be locked down for, I believe it was like two weeks for them enough time to search the entire yard. And then you have to do unlocks, incremental unlocks and things like that. So we didn't have to do the long one month, two month, three month lockdowns anymore. I have, I have my own theory about that. Let me know if it's, right. if it's true or not. In my own theory uh, regarding they used, they used to be one year lockdowns, two year lockdowns, sometimes even more right back before. Yeah. Right. And, and then they stopped. They simply stopped, man. They stopped. Like they didn't say, Hey, uh, Hector, we're just going to stop doing lockdowns. They kind of just, Hey, let them up. They're coming up. And it's like, Wow, you know what I mean? Like it just started happening. Now, yeah. something that I kind of noticed, and this is my theory, is do you, before when when let's say let's say the Southerners and the Blacks got into it, right? Slam them for uh -huh. slam them for a year. You let them up. A lot of the times they would fight again, try to get the revenge or get back or get the upper hand. I right. believe that when they started lifting up, lifting the lockdowns, that you. Hey, it's basically you fight, boom, go back out there again. You fight, go back out there again. Did that discourage you guys from fighting? Um, I wouldn't say it discouraged. I feel like 
because I could I could say specifically in one event where the Bloods and the Crips ended up getting into it. And we went on lockdown for that. And then when we came up, we got into it again. We came up and that was it. It was like one or two, three incidences, three lockdowns, three incidences. And that was it. We had to understand, okay, you've got some, we got some, we're good, you know? Right, and right. At the, letting us up actually helped because people was like, we don't want to do the long lockdowns anymore, you know? Yeah. As long as no one died, then people were like, okay, it's cool. Okay. As long as your homies died or anything like that, you was, you was like, all right, we're good. Okay, okay. So that, that, that makes sense, man. Like going, going until, okay, okay, cool. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a fight. You shake hands at the end of it and that's a wrap. Yeah, because people want to program. They're like, man, I want to I wanna get them visits. I want to go to canteen. I want to get my packages. I want to do everything right. that you know, the little bit of things that we can do, let's do it. So you said Pelican Bay had nothing on high desert. No. What were some of the instant, instant observations on your part where you're like, wow, man, this is crazy? Um, the instant observations were, well, in Pelican Bay, the thing that they had, they had um, the yard that I was on that made it less dangerous. It was still dangerous. People still died, things like that. But what made it less dangerous is the PIA. You know what PIA is. So being able to have those type of jobs, being to have those type of incomes made people want to go to work and do certain things because now there's an economy on the yard. There's actually money being generated. But in high desert, there was no economy. There was no drugs. There was nothing. So there was no drugs. There was no um, economy from PIA. There was nothing. So all people had was to be angry. And so every small thing turned into something large because essentially we don't have anything to lose. We don't we don't have anything coming, so we have nothing to lose. Right. That's a um yeah, I'm not gonna ask you to go into detail, man, but as far as I, I always assumed drugs was a constant flow everywhere, man. That's kind of my assumption. Oh, no. No, even you even in Pelican Bay, I would say in because you gotta think, because you're so far, mm -hmm. because you're so far it's harder to get introduced. Yeah. It's harder for those to get introduced. So the whole time I was up there in four years, I probably saw a weed twice. And that's Man. because somebody came with it. Right. You know, somebody came with it. So there there wasn't anything like that. You know, and in high desert it was kind of similar. Like there wasn't anything there. So it was just violence. It was just a lot of violence. That's interesting, man. That's interesting because from my, from my experience, the majority of the violence was based on drugs. If you think about it, right? The majority, disrespect, disrespect is huge and dope is another thing, right? Debt. Mm. Was this violence just from, from hostility, anger, rage, um, bo it bo boredom? Be well, for, for, I would say for us, the main, us being black, the main thing that would happen is basketball court, <laughs> you know, like playing sports. That's where a lot of a lot of fights, a lot of riots, a lot of things happen over sports. Um, Hispanics, as you know, I mean, it could be just anything, you know, <laughs> yeah. anything. And like, there's no there's no fighting. So what happens if you say the wrong thing? I saw someone get stabbed because he had too many cellies. So like, you can't get along with your cellies, right? You can't follow the rules and regulations because you keep fighting your cellies and he got stabbed on the yard. And, you, and I know people are hearing it's like, what? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's one man who makes the rules. And if you go against his rules, that's... I, man, this is very intriguing, man. I, I'm actually blown away because of the level of violence from what I've heard from everybody, right? The le I'm over here thinking, man, these guys are ringing up drug deaths to the math. They're just massacring these people. No, no, it's, it's, man, it was one individual and this one was, I ain't gonna lie, this one was kind of like, was sad to me mm -hmm. because he was a Hispanic dude, but he didn't run with the Hispanics. He was just a regular dude. He was just a regular dude and they didn't like him. You know, they didn't like him. And I watched him get stabbed in the day room. And the way it, the way it happened was so like orchestrated. It was so... So as you, as you know, how two uh, one eighty is designed. So they're right there, and what happens is they end up 
uh, getting on somebody on the upper yard. So all the police officers on the lower yard ran to the upper yard in his day room. And I'm in my cell looking out in the day room. And when all the police run in the tower, he goes to the front door because he has to open up the doors for everybody. So he has to open up doors for his officers to run and then check the yard. So while he's over there, they're stabbing this guy in the day room. And he's just, and he's a, he's a chubby young kid who was just weird talking. And he lied a lot talking about, oh, I'm a rapper and I know this guy, I know this guy. He was just a little weird, but he wasn't a bad guy. It was, he wasn't a bad kid. He was just, didn't know how to fall in line. And man, they, they butchered him. They, they butchered him and he was getting stabbed for a while to where the off the, the tower, he was right up under the gun tower. And so he, the officer's walking back and forth, but he can't see them. He can't see them. So he, it was a while. So when he finally did see him, he had to run and call another man. So now they're running back down. It was just, it was a long time. So long that he gave up fighting was just laying there and getting stabbed. It was, it was sad. Did he, did he, did he die? I don't know if he died. I don't know if he died. Probably. I know he it probably sounds like he did, right? Like, I don't know, but like, um, and, and for the viewers out there, man, and for the viewers outside of the state of California, understand what he just said. It's real. If you don't fall in line, right? This guy was, all he was was just a little different, right? That's it. I made a video about a white inmate that was overweight, scraggly hair. He refused to mm -hmm. work out. He refused to shave his beard. They hit that oh, dude they... right here with a knife. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Simple as that, man. Simple. As... I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Simple is just not, not following the simple, simple, simple rules or that their their rules. And it's 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 twisted world, man. It's treacherous. Um, yeah. So that one, I can see how that one kind of hit home because it's like, hey, man, this is a, this dude isn't part of the game, but he got yeah. enveloped in it. Yeah, it, I think the part about those instances is how how desensitized we become to it. Right. You know, on the yard, and we're like, oh, somebody's gonna get stabbed, and a normal person would be like, oh my god, there's violence, and you would you would shy away from that. But what we do, it's almost like we get our popcorn and like, oh, somebody's getting stabbed today. I want to go to the yard. And I want to watch it. Oh, it was a good one, and you start to compare it to the last one or this one, the previous one, and now you just walk like, "Oh, did you see how they got him?" And like that's, we become desensitized to this violence, and that's the worst part of it for me. Likewise, 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 man, because it affects your home life, it affects you know your spouse, your children, it affects the whole dynamics of life, man. So, any other drastic high desert incidents that that stand out to you? Um. <laughs> man, it's so it's so bit like when I tell you there were so many stabs. Right. I saw I've never seen that many stabbings in all the prisons I was in. There were so many. I'm in the the white boys. They get shot because they're stabbing people, there, and the knife gets stuck in someone's neck, and so he's trying to yank the knife out of the neck, and he ended up getting shot by the tower. Um, it was it, it. There were a lot of stabbings. Real quick, a man. Lot. I keep it extremely real on this channel, real quick. What was your thought, and you just said it right now, about the shooting of the actual Mini 14 uh, at High Desert? Because everybody that I've heard, because they're like, yeah, man, we fire the Mini 14 all the time. Did you notice that? No. No? No. Like the, and, and even the time when they shot the Mini, that was on the upper yard. Okay upper yard when they shot the mini. I actually have never been on a yard and I'm talking about I've seen riots, I've seen, you know, people getting killed. Yeah. But I've never been on the yard. I've heard it from the upper yard, but I've never been on the yard and saw the mini get fired. Man, man. Okay. I was under the assumption that hey, it was just fired, but I hear what you're saying. That's probably just luck of the draw on your part, man. Yeah. <laughs> luck of the draw. <laughs> Listen, Hector, there were so many stabbings. I'm I'm <laughs> telling you it was just like what the hell dude? yeah I'm killed hey it's ridiculous man so okay you do how much time total did you do uh incarcerated uh 16 years 16 years to the day um because i got locked up february 7th and i got out february 17th 16 years later man did you prior to going home did you have a game plan um i had a game plan and my game plan I, honestly, everything that I've been doing since I've been home was not directly a part of my game plan. Right. You know, that's one thing I talked to my friend about. It's like we can have the best laid plans in prison, 
but those best laid plans in, in prison do not prepare you for the real world. They don't prepare you for the real world because we don't know what to expect out here and life moves fast out here. It, it, it truly moves fast. So my ultimate game plan was to not go back to prison. Right. I, um, go back to my old um, criminal addictive thinking. Right. Those were, those were my game plans was to rebuild those family ties, you know, was to volunteer to give back to the community that I helped to destroy. Those were my game plans. I didn't know how I was going to facilitate those plans, but that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I have done since I've been home. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. Is there any courses or classes while you were in that prepared you for that? Because it sounded like a whole change of mindset. It, it was my first change of mindset happened not in a class, but through action because I caught in 2018, I caught my last battery. That was my, that was actually my last 115 was in 2018. I got out in 2022. Um, but that was my last 115. And I had, you know, gang member, one of my homies did something. I had to put hands on him and me and somebody else put hands on him. We caught a battery and I'm like, you know, like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what truly am I doing? I'm in a good spot. I ended up going to Ironwood. I got override to a level three. So override, I still had level four points. I paroled with level four points, but for a certain amount of time, I had been doing good, meaning no write-ups. And so they gave me the opportunity to go to a lower level. And that's what an override is for those who don't know. Cause I know you know what an override yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> so I got, I was able to go to a level three and it was like a different world for me. You know, it was a different world. I'm out to sell all the time. Yeah. I get to do all these, I'm like, wow, I'm actually going to I'm sign up for college. I'm going to self-help groups. I'm doing all these different things. And then I'm right back into the, to the bullshit and doing that. So I ended up coming to the yard after that. They, they allowed me to stay until I, you know, end up going to Sentinella. They ended up sending me to Sentinella, but I told my homies, like, I didn't stop game banging at that time, but I just let them know, like, man, I've done enough. Yeah. You know, I've made my name. I've done enough. Y'all know what I'm about. Stop. Don't, don't come to me for none of this. If we get into it with another race, if it's something big, right. then I'm there. But if it's anything else, let me do me. Let me do my time. Let me, let me do that. And they respected it. So that's where my ultimate change began when I stopped fucking up. Excuse my language. When I, that, makes sense. that makes sense. You know? Yeah. Cool. So, so what, what are you doing now? What are some of the stuff? I mean, share it with the crowd because this is gonna, this is gonna get that, that message out there, man. Where can people find you? Right. Um, let us know what, what you're doing now. Right. So since I've been home man, I've been foot on the gas, man. Yeah. you know, foot, you know, um, I ended up, First off, I was blessed to have an opportunity to work at the gym Chula Vista. Um, and I met this great guy. Don't tell him I said that though. But um <laughs> no, go ahead, man. Go ahead. This is this is the time. <laughs> Steven Kruckerberg, man, met this met this great guy, man. And, you know, we was able to put together I had a dream when I was in prison to start a podcast. And the podcast that I wanted to start was about and I didn't have the name at the time, but it was just about changing the perception of what it means to be formerly incarcerated. You know, and I heard a couple of stories when I was sitting in a cell about individuals who one man in particular who helped put the whole Jordan brand together. And what people didn't know about him, he's a multimillionaire now, you know, works for Nike, everything. But he was a gang member and he went to prison for a murder at 17 years old or 16 years old. And he did like four or five years because he was juvenile. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, why don't people know these stories, you know? Right. And so that's where it was sparked. So fast forward, I meet Steven. We talk and he asked me something that I was passionate about. I let him know, like, you know, I had an idea for this podcast, you know, changing the perception, you know, showing people who are coming home, like, look, you can live great and exciting lives. Your life is not over. You know, it's actually just beginning and you don't have to go back to your old ways of thinking and doing the things you used to do. You can do it the right way and be successful, you know. And he was like, man, I'm with it. Long story short, we started Post P Chronicles. And, you know, not only that, we also, Stephen had a dream of having some type of um, 
you know, given back to the community. So we was able to start Post P Chronicles group. And inside of that group, what we do is offer free memberships to individuals who are formerly incarcerated to some at-risk youth. And we give them free memberships to the gym in Chula Vista. Also with that, we ask them to come to, um, we have self-help groups twice a month, every other Saturday. We're actually having one this Saturday um, where we talk, we you know, we have prompts and we just see how we can help them better their self in life and stay on the right track. So those are two of the things I've been able to go to schools and tell my story and talk to the kids, give back to the community um, and volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Man, that's that's what I've been. That's what I've been doing. Also, the homework group, Second Chance. Um, I've been with that group and they are doing amazing things. So I've just been trying to give back and just, you know, and win, man. I've been traveling, you know, I got my passport. Yeah, <laughs> that's dude, that's what's up. Approval. Man, so life is really good out here, man. It's so really good. I'm proud of you, dude. So for the viewers watching, they want to tap in with you. Hey, I, I, I want to get involved in what he's doing. I want to share my story. I want to go hit that gym like he's saying. You know, I'm, I was formerly incarcerated. How can they reach you? Um, so you can reach me on IG um, as Instagram. Um, at second chance will that's two nd chance will uh, you can reach me on facebook my name is william riggs and that is my facebook name william riggs uh, you can reach me at uh james midas at james midas one at icloud.com and just reach out um you know watch watch the podcast post p chronicles on youtube on uh spotify check us out man we got incredible stories one if you haven't heard i'm pretty sure you have hector bravo <laughs> <laughs> you know just uh just tap in let me know what you think yeah so i'm gonna link all his links on the bottom you guys better go over there check it out subscribe to the youtube because this is how this works man people go through it they come out they want to share that message and this is how it works networking man it's awesome it's awesome before we close out is there anything you would like to share with the viewers any message of hope anything to the youngsters anything the mic's yours man um first and foremost i just want to tell people who probably are going through something if they're if you're young watching this man it's not over it seems like life is just uh, you know overwhelming but i promise you it just looks like that right now and you have exciting things in your future just stay focused um people who are coming home from prison man look at me if if, if my life is an example it, it's good out here man it's good and at no time is anything worth giving your time back to the prison system it's not worth it you know, uh, for people who have never been incarcerated, who not going through anything. If you see someone like me and I hope that you um, open your hearts to us, you know, someone who is formerly incarcerated because we're just like you. We just made a mistake and we don't want to be judged for our worst mistake. Just imagine if you was judged for your worst mistake for the rest of your life. You know, how would you feel? It wouldn't be great. You know, so those are just some of the things that I want to tell people, man. Life is good. Live, love and just be your best self every single day. Solid, man. Solid. Um, you, you're an upstanding individual, dude. You're you're a man of honor. I can see that, right? In the short period of time that I've known you, just the way you conduct yourself, man. Very admirable. With that being said, I'm going to close it out for the viewers out there. Uh, thank you for coming on, dude. I appreciate it, man. Your, your story is awesome, and it's going to help people, no doubt, man. Appreciate you. Yup. So with that, keep pushing forward, guys.